I just realized I didn't hit the go live button so people actually can't see. So we're starting over just a second. <laughs> Hopefully it's gonna go. All right, now it's live for real. Welcome everybody to our Quarantine Snacks Com Composer Talkback. Um, I'm Beth Rite, the Artistic Director of the Boston New Music Initiative. And with me today are um, 11 wonderful composers that are gonna talk to you a little bit about their pieces that were on our Quarantine Snacks series. Um, we're gonna go in order of the, um, that they were presented. Um, we'll have, I'll ask a couple of questions of the composer and uh, then, Anybody in the audience that has questions, please uh, type it in the chat and I'll see it and we'll ask those questions um, throughout and as we see them. So, great. So uh, we're gonna start today um, with Blair Whittington, um, whose piece Sparrow was on volume one and it's for solo clarinet. Um, so Blair, my first question, uh, and I, yeah, there we go. Uh, my first question is just to tell us, um, to ask you to tell us a little bit about the piece and its inspiration or its construction. Oh. Okay, there we go. Now I'm unmuted. There we go. Okay, um, the piece Sparrow is part of um, my three bird songs, which I wrote all in the quarantine since March. It's the last of the three, so I needed something to contrast with the first two. And actually, they've all three been performed twice, so that's nice, um, given the pandemic. So um, they're fast, slow, and then the last movement, Sparrow, is fast again. So um, I just mostly needed something that contrasted with the other two that was bright and colorful. Um, the woodwinds are used to um, doing birds, playing um, things that are reminiscent of birds, so that was kind of a natural. So um, the first movement was... Um, warbling and the second movement was dove song. I had a couple of doves sitting above my front porch who um, had babies there and then the third movement was sparrow so um, that's how it all came about. Um, so then uh, yeah my question uh, the follow-up is how do you feel we're going to ask all of the composers this but how do you feel mm -hmm. about writing shorter works um, and was it your intention when you wrote the work or um, you know, is it part of a larger work or, you know, kind of the, just that in general about writing shorter works? Yeah, well, I'm used to writing shorter works. Um, there's a lot of calls out there for shorter works. So um, I've been doing that for quite a while. It's, um, so the piece is about three minutes long. I think you asked for five minutes or shorter. So it felt, felt well within the time frame um, of what you were asking. So, um, that worked out very well, but yeah, I'm used to writing shorter works. So, um, my final question was actually um, what other birds were in the collection, but you you asked that already. And then, um, <laughs> was there a like? Do you really are you like a birder, or is there a particular reason that you really liked bird, or just that you happen to be watching them a lot? Um, yeah, I mean, I was hearing them a lot because I've been home quite a bit since March, I think as all of us have been. Um, and those doves certainly were great. And, um, you know, it works well with the clarinet um, as well. So um, I do have a couple of pet um, parallettes, which are small. Um, they're small parrots and they live in my office. So I hear them quite a bit. So there might be something subconsciously that um, <laughs> they are projecting to me as well. So. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Blair. As I said, we're gonna keep this to an hour and uh, we have 11 composers. So um, we're gonna move on. But if you do have questions uh, for Blair or any of our composers as we go along, please uh, put them in the chat on Facebook. Um, so, uh, the next person, the next piece on our list is, uh, the lament for theater, Theodore, sorry, uh, the lament for Theodore from, uh, Jimmy Kachulis. And please correct my pronunciation if needed. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> Quite impressed by the way. <laughs> Most people butcher that name. <laughs> uh, uh, this is a, a piece, uh, um, that uses a traditional uh, rhythm that comes from Northern Greece that, uh, I, I hate to admit this, but that we inherited from the Turks. Uh, it's, a, it's a slow, um, sort of a hypnotic dance uh, in the slow nine. 
uh, and, and the lyrics, whether they're in a popular song form or some broader like this, all have to do with, uh, you know, the misery of life and things like that. And, and this, the, when, when you're playing the, uh, a Greek wedding, this is where they start throwing the plates. Um, it, there's something about this rhythm that totally possesses people. And they can tell from the first, that there's certain characteristic little rhythmic hits in there. They can tell from the first hit that it's going to be this rhythm and they start to get very carried away emotionally. I, I can never figure out why. Um, and there was a call uh, initially for um, uh, laments in tribute to uh, uh, Theodore Antoniou, who has been a, a, a composer and conductor and a great champion of contemporary music uh, centered at BU. Uh, and he ran, uh, created uh, um, and, and ran Alia 3 there featuring uh, um, uh, wonderful composers, um, uh, uh, and especially from, from Greece, he would bring over composers from Greece. And in and, um, any case, uh, so I uh, kind of put this together and um, it's been uh, selected for a number of different things um, and just reorchestrated versions. Um, the original was for flute, this one was for viola and uh, it just got selected in a, a version for clarinet uh, for another tribute. There's, there's a number of tributes going around. You folks have probably seen them. Morton Feldman and Luciano Berrio. And it's been selected for a bunch of those. So it's, it's great to hear the viola version. Uh, and by the way, uh, I love writing short pieces as, as Blair yeah. mentioned. There's a lot of calls out there. For that. Um, and I think we have a better shot, you know, at getting um, uh, uh, selected and performed uh, you know, it's less taxing for the performers as well as for the audience than they can shift gears after a few minutes. Uh, I, I write a lot of pieces in, in series. So this is part of my Mediterranean portrait series. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's really nice if people have bigger space on a pro program, they can put two or three or five together. Uh, all of them are within three minutes. Uh, and it gives the performers uh, a freedom in their programming as well. Yeah, I really agree about like, it's uh, nice to have the, the flexibility. So as somebody that um, writes music, but also, um, you know, I'm heavily involved in the programming. When you have the smaller works, it really does allow for more flexibility. And you're right, it is it more likely <laughs> um, to, so for somebody to take a chance on something a little shorter. So um, my last question is there. Um, uh, you answered all my, my, my follow-up questions, which was about the Lament Collection or more about um, the Theodore um, to who it was dedicated. So um, that, yeah. So um, thank you, Jimmy. Uh, we have, I don't have any questions right now, but those of you watching, if you think of something that you would like to ask Blair or Jimmy, please feel free to ask at any time and we'll um, pop back to them to ask those questions. Um, and also, I'll take this moment to plug, make sure you watch the videos. They're all still available on the Boston New Music Initiative's um, Facebook page. They're beautiful. Um, and, you know, so if you haven't heard all of these pieces, take the time to go back and catch all of them. Um, all right. Um, so up next is uh, Kirsten Johnson and her piece, um, Expression Number One um, for Piano. Hi, Kristen, don't forget to unmute. <laughs> Sorry about that. I do know what I'm doing over here. <laughs> so hello from Oxford. It's a little bit later at night here, but it's, it's wonderful to be part of this chat. And I just wanted to first of all say thank you to Beth and the team there for just putting all these concerts together because I know it's probably taken a lot of time and effort. So we as composers, we really appreciate it. So thank you. Um, one of the things I've been doing during lockdown, I'm currently in a lockdown. We already had a lockdown in the spring, so I've been having sort of lots of downtime. I've been going through all my files and revisiting compositions. And when this call came out, I didn't actually write this for the call, but I came across and I thought, actually, it's not as bad as I thought it was, you know? So I thought I would just put it out there and see what people thought. And it was just wonderful to hear Minato play it and to hear somebody else's interpretation of what I had put together. Um, 
when I wrote the piece, I'm going to answer your second question first, Beth. Um, I was, I'm a pianist. A, a lot of my work is as a professional classical pianist. And I love Prokofiev. And I was inspired by the Vision Fugitive, which is a set of 20 very, very short pieces. At the time, I was thinking about learning it. I didn't actually end up learning it, but that's what I was looking at. And when I wrote this piece, I wanted to write something small that was really concise. Um, and also I was looking at um, structures at the time. So you'll notice that it has an ostinato that carries the left hand all the way through. Um, it's dark, it's brooding, it's sort of creating an atmosphere of sort of just real density really. Um, and the the structure is sort of the rhythms around the Fibonacci sequence, which is kind of it's been there a long time, but it works. So the, the opening melody is one, one, two, three, five, eight in those groups of notes. And the melody itself was based on an octatonic scale. So it's actually really formulaic, but it worked. Once I got the initial bit there, I then just developed it and it was freely extemporaneous. Um, there wasn't any structure after that. I just took the material after I sort of set it in place and, and let it become what it became. Um, because I wanted to write more expressions, I was thinking this would be a group of pieces. This is expression number one, but then I got distracted by other things in my life. So because of the lockdown and because I've actually come back to this piece, I've now actually mapped out the next set of expressions. So um, I've really been inspired maybe to continue on in the set and I have a plan of doing 10 or 11 of these little pieces. So thank you for that. It sort of spurred me on. Great. Um, yeah, you answered my first two questions. Um, my uh, follow-up question, I actually was curious if it was related at all to expressionist painting. Um, so I put the videos together and uh, for those of you that have watched them, I used um, images with um, several of the pieces, almost all of them, I think. Um, and I just, I went and like in search of expressionist paintings to go with this piece because it just, it made me think of it like the, that sort of dark expressionist. Um, and then I went down a whole rabbit hole and uh, found a whole bunch of female expressionist painters. And so anyway, I was just curious if it was, if it, it was not directly influenced by that. Oh, mute. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realize I'd been muted again. It wasn't influenced by that, Beth, but I'm really into art and I thought the pictures worked really, really well, actually. So it was just the right thing to do. And I think that's the really nice thing about putting something out there as a composer is that you have your initial idea, but then when you get people like yourself feeding back, actually, have you thought about the expressionist paintings or have you thought about this? It actually makes the work become into its own and it develops in, in depth. And it's really, really good for me to get that feedback. So thank you for that. Great, thanks, Kristen. Um, all right, uh, next up is gonna be um, um, uh, Sakari Dixon Vanderveer and her piece, which I probably, which is um, the Somber Prince and his, I can't remember the exact translation and I'm not gonna butcher the Spanish, but um, Sakari, tell us a little bit about your That's piece. okay, you got my name right, wonderful. I've gotten a lot of, <laughs> interesting interpretations, including Shakira, which I am not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so the, the title of this piece is El Príncipe Sombrío y los Recuerdos de su Niñez. And yes, it translates to um, the somber prince and the memories of his childhood. It's, um, it's actually one of the older works in my catalog that's available. It's on my website. And um, when I wrote this piece, I actually wrote it for myself to play at, um, at my recital in college. I think it was my junior recital, or actually, no, actually sophomore year. It was a short, short recital that I did. And um, at the time, um, I had pre previously written like a solo work for like an accompanied um, alto flute that I wanted to, um, being a violist myself, I wanted to sort of explore the different timbres in my own instrument in ways that I hadn't before. And so um, the, the way I sort of guided the form was to think of a storyline kind of in the beginning, or at least sort of like little vignettes, right? The, the, um, and I, I was sort of inspired by the idea of writing a character piece, but in this sense, it's not just a snapshot of like the character currently, but also sort of the character development. And I'm like, oh, here's actually, you know, how they got this way and that sort of thing. And so, um, sort of in the in the score it actually does give like a little bit more of a narrative basically there's this 
there's this prince who he's kind of evil and whatnot, but then we look at sort of like why and what happened in his past. And it turns out that like, oh, he did have like a humble upbringing, but you know, um, after certain tragedies and whatnot, he sort of desired to sort of take revenge and, and gain power and things like that. So um, in, the, in the piece of Violas actually uses a mute sort of, sort of to work as like the flashback. And um, I found myself, um, when I perform this piece, I've often done it for like, like children's or family concerts a lot too, just to sort of show them more of the, the timbre of the viola and the different extended techniques that can happen. And they sort of, you know, when the Sul Ponticello comes and it's all metallic and weird sounding, they're like, oh, you know, what is that? So um, it's definitely, it's an older piece and I listen to it and I'm like, oh yeah, that's it's definitely one of my older compositions, but it's still, it's fun to hear and to sort of revive and whatnot, so yeah. Great. Um, so then, yeah, my follow-up question was, um, how do you feel about writing shorter works? It sounds like this wasn't specifically in your mind when you wrote it, but um, yeah. Yeah, I think looking back, I probably wrote it um, on the shorter side on purpose because of the, the time constraints of the recital that I was doing at the time. But most of my works these days tend to lean towards a like 10 to 12 minute range. <laughs> And so um, when I do come across shorter works, I definitely have to um, find ways to, it, it's, a, it's a challenge compositionally because I tend to, once I get ideas going, I tend to generate more and more and you know variations and things like that. So it's so much easier just to spin out a longer work, but um, doing a, a solo work can be, you know, or, sorry, a short work can be like a good challenge. Cool. My um, final question was actually, um, why is the title in Spanish? Um, at the time, I was actually studying Spanish. I did a Spanish minor in college, and I studied <laughs> Spanish in high school as well. And it's such a beautiful language. And um, I had, I know this piece and maybe a couple others too that I named in Spanish at the time. Um, I haven't done that sort of thing recently, but that's sort of the reason why. It's just my admiration for the language. Good enough reason. Great. Um, all right. Thanks, Sakari. Um, we... Thank you for doing this. <laughs> all right. Uh, we have one more for, from volume two, um, the Lament for Theodore from Minato. So um, I will pass that over to uh, Minato Sakamoto. Hi, um, uh, my name is Minato Sakamoto. Um, I compose this piece for uh, the same call for score uh, uh, that somebody mentioned. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, uh, in in this session. Um, and uh, I used um, a chunk of data I have frequently used for my composition and took that data um, and processed them in an algorithmic way to uh, generate interesting music. And so I, I established uh, an algorithm in which I can operate a lot of parameters. And depending on what kind of results I want to make, um, I can just change the parameters to see what kind of things happen and take uh, the favorite portion of the algorithm, algorithmic result and make it into composition. So also that's how the composition works. So this time, this is a lament. So I experiment with uh, several parameters to see uh, um, um, how, how the piece can evoke a lamenting feeling. Mm. Yeah, so I am actually the one that performed this if you guys didn't catch, but yeah, yeah. I think um, a lot of the, for this piece, it, um, uh, it did use um, train sounds, if I'm correct, as like part of the, what you processed to get the through the algorithm, you use train sounds to process through the algorithm to get the final results. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's not a part of the um, uh, the uh, composition. Yeah. Actually. So yeah. Yeah. I used the train uh, data, but you know that's just the data. It can be anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, so it has no relation to. Ah. Trains. Okay. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I did notice, yeah, that it, there's a lot of um, more downward motions, which is uh, very characteristic of the lament. I'm sure you probably mm -hmm. came across that when you were working on the algorithm. 
Yeah. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah, because uh, algorithm result uh, was really uh, neutral. You know, I I saw the even numbers of uh, going up and going down, ascending and descending. Uh, but when um, I process them manually, you know, I consciously picked up a part that contains lamenting downward phrases, and you know, combined uh, some portions I picked up to make it a uh, convincing music. Great. So um, my other question was for um, was oh a uh, connection to um, uh, oh the question about short pieces. Is there um, a particular reason that you chose this length, um, or you know in general do you tend to write shorter pieces? Oh yeah, so I mean there's nothing special about writing a short piece. Uh, composers need to work on restrictions if you are given. Um, unlimited time for unlimited instrumentation for unlimited lengths, then you are just stuck. To be creative, you need uh, some sort of limitation. It might be, you know, you need to write for one instrument, you need to write for an orchestra, you need to write for four instruments, you need to write for an elementary school student. You know, those restrictions <laughs> make uh, compositions all creative. And writing a short at least, that restriction is one of the creative restrictions um, I'm privileged to have in this composition. Yeah, it's a really a uh, great point. And I noticed that there's a lot of nodding on the Zoom, so uh, from the other composers. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you, Minato. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that is the end of section two. We'll take back, um, um, I haven't gotten, um, we did have one quick question um, on whether Blair used real bird song or not for his composition. And he, he did say um, that he did. He uh, created his own bird song. Um, and uh, he added a few other details in the chat. Um, is there anything else you wanna add Blair? Ah, there we go. We're unmuted. Okay. Um, no, I mean, I was thinking more of a, um, you know, a sparrow. I mean, there's birds that are faster than a sparrow, but a sparrow is a very small kind of nimble bird. And so I was thinking the clarinet is kind of similar to a, a sparrow. You know, a clarinet is, can be a very nimble instrument, of course. Um, and also with the bird songs, um, it's also an idea of using kind of short fragmentary lines. Um, to have just a few notes with rests in between and then alternating that with um, longer melodies. So um, a, lot, a lot of times um, you can hear the bird-like characteristics in that. So. Cool. Mm -hmm. all right. um, so, um, all right, well, we'll continue on along our way. And also, um, we uh, did point out that the, all the um, videos are also on YouTube for anybody that's not Facebook savvy or have Facebook access easily. Um, all right, so um, next we're gonna move on to volume three. And the first piece on that uh, was from William Joel, 30 Degrees Below. Hello there. Ah, so, um... First thing I want to say is that, unlike probably many of you, uh, I do not play the piano. I never learned. Uh, but take a guess as to what instrument I did learn to play uh, starting back in high school. Clarinet, which is a lot of the reason why I wrote this piece is because, and in fact, a lot of my compositions, I probably give a lot more weight to the uh, clarinet in compositions than I probably should. Um, I just... This act, this piece actually was um, written for another call quite a few, couple of years ago, and it didn't make the cut back then, but I always loved the work. And then when this call came, I said, hey, I'll try again. And it was accepted. And Yasmin did an absolutely fabulous job with it. She, she got the point of it, which is it's all about play. And hopefully when you listen to the piece, you can just hear the playing and you have two competing themes. You have a, a more traditional melodic theme that keeps trying to come through. But you also have this other little theme like like a winter sprite that, that's, that keeps going. Da -da -da, 
and keeps trying to compete with it. And in fact, the very end of the piece, this little sprite theme has the last word. Uh, and I, I just had fun writing it. it and, and, I'm, and I really, really loved the way that Yasmin performed it. I thought it was, it was just spot on. Well, I know that she would be very glad to hear that. She's, she's, a very, um, she's very particular and um, really wants to, the composers to be happy. So. I, I, I know. It was, it was abs uh, actually, when it was over, I sent her an, uh, a message through Facebook saying, you did a wonderful job. Thank you. This is wonderful. And she sent me a note back saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I couldn't, I couldn't play it up, up to, up to uh, tempo. And I'm like, she she was only a couple of beats off per per minute. That's all she was. Ma, she really is persnickety about her performances. It was incredible. She did a wonderful job. Um, great. So um, my my question about uh, writing shorter works is now. Um, yeah, I, I, I tend to write a lot of shorter works. I mean, I'm still a full-time college professor, which means I have all that to do. And by the way, um, my background, to be honest, uh, I have degrees in chemistry and computer science. I do not have degrees in music, but uh, I started composing when I was a teenager. Uh, on and off, all the way through, uh, had a wonderful time in college because uh, my university had a wonderful uh, score collection, literally right next door to the listening room where there were the matching LPs. You guys remember LPs, right? Plastic, yeah. Uh, and so what I would do, I'd, I'd often have like an hour, two hours. What I would do is I'd snatch the score off the shelf, get the matching record out, and I'd just sit there studying the score. And I, I would do that hours and hours. It's a great way to learn. You can see how other composers do it. Uh, but with my time constraints, I do a lot of short works. And in fact, I have a series of piano, I call them sketches, that are probably, most of them are in the one minute to minute and a half range. And the longest probably goes to around four minutes but they're generally about a minute, minute and a half. They really are sketches, little quickies. And uh, I'm up to 29 right now. I'm still working on them. Cool. Um, so my final question ah, was, where's my notes? Oh yeah. Um, so when I saw the title of 30 Degrees Below, I was actually thinking of something less playful just because that's so cold. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I'm just so I'm just curious. Is there a particular reason that you, you chose that title? Um, yes, and Yasmin, I notice is on the line. She's going to get a, a laugh out of this. The original call that I had written it for was for bass clarinet. Mm. Is why it was thirty degrees below. In other words, it's way down there. Uh, but actually, it kind of fits because it. I love the graphics that you you guys included with the video. Uh, uh, as part of quarantine snacks and i just i just loved it because it was all about ice etc and i when you listen to it you can hear like 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 i said like a winter sprite dancing around trying to kind of uh mix it up and it just it just worked out beautifully i loved it great thanks so much william welcome all right um our, our next piece is um variation on sorry Lolanu Hashem, um, and that is from Aaron Alter. Hi, Beth. Thank you very much for your performance, by the way. You're very talented. Flutist, <laughs> Thank vocalist, you. composer. Um, so Lolanu Hashem was a work that I wrote for women's chorus and instrumental ensemble. It's a setting of Psalm 115, and it starts out with Lolanu Hashem, not for our sake, our Lord. And while I was writing it, I was thinking about variations almost immediately because it's got a catchy tune. The conductor who did the premiere called it a Middle Eastern Calypso, which is not what I intended, but that's what he called it. But I thought about variations immediately. I was sketching them out. I thought, well, if I write another work, I'll, I'll write variations on it. So there was a call for scores uh, for two minute works. And so I thought, okay, well, why don't I write a variation on this theme? And since it was two minutes, I couldn't say variations. That's more common, plural. And I just, there's only room for one. So I just call it variation, singular. 
And the theme lasted about two minutes. So it, it worked out and uh, it was recorded. Uh, the flutist Ivona Glinka, who did a lot of the calls her scores mentioned here, uh, recorded it. And later on, I wrote another work for cello and piano variations on Lola and Hashem. So, so I think the theme had a lot of uh, capabilities for variations because it's very catchy and, and it's got a really good harmonic uh, rhythm to it. So that's the origin of it. But the thing about two minute works when you asked about that is that when you get started, I get started, uh, I have to think about wrapping it up. So it's kind of an interesting thing because I get into the groove and I'm thinking, okay, now we're into it. And now I have to think about ending it. So it's kind of like writing a popular song where you, or at least in the old days when we had limitations on uh, the, the length, we had to think about wrapping it up pretty, pretty soon. You get, you get the listener involved you get them hooked a little bit with a little, little catchy tune and then you, then you wind it down and then you want them, you get them wanting for more. I mean, hoping for more, more pieces. That's uh, that's what's nice about a two minute work. You, you whet their appetite for more. Yeah. Yeah. That can be very true. So um, just to clarify, this is kind of a question you you, uh, the variation is based on the original melody from your choral work. Yes. Yes, it's, it is the melody and then uh, it was a slight variation on it and I used, I used an alto flute, I chose that because I wanted to get a little bit of the bass line as well as the melody and the alto flute has a stronger lower register than the C flute does. So I was able to, in, in the way that Bach would, would do in his solo violin sonatas and partitas, you, you have a little bit of the harmony, a little bit of the bass, a little bit of the melody and try to interweave that so you, you get a little uh, flavor of the entire theme. Yeah, I definitely got that sense uh, when I was like working on it, you know, the, the different layers a little bit and, and the lower, lower register, so. Great, um, all right, thank you so much, Aaron. You're welcome. Um, next, um, we have uh, um, Julio Quinones, um, Partita Asia. So Julio, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, this work? Yeah, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for choosing my piece and for give, having given it an amazing performance. Um, basically the work um, for Solo Viola is, I wrote the piece for the High Score Festival 2019, which I was accepted for uh, after I graduated from my undergrad in composition. And as, as many may know, after you finish studying and being, and being surrounded by a lot of composers, you start asking yourself, what is your musical identity and how and you can write music that is gearing up to your more specific style. So being Puerto Rican, because I'm, I'm from Puerto Rico, um, I started to look at our traditional music for inspiration to to try to find a way to do something that isn't so much as national music, but it's, it's, it's a way of using traditional music in a more sincere and maybe original way, if, if such a thing can, be, can ever be done. And I took the inspiration from a traditional music, dance music that's called bomba, which is originally a, a genre of music that was, um, that actually happened around the African slaves that were imported to Puerto Rico at the turn of the 18th century. So basically this music was played uh, strictly with, with drums, the different different kinds of, of, of drums. And is, it was danced in a circle made by the drums and people would worship, would practice their religion and their dances and their, their festivities all around this dance circle that was made. Um, and one of the most popular uh, bomba songs is actually called uh, Bambulae Se Aya, which is part of the, of the title of the piece. Because what I wanted to do was mix the idea of a classical um, European partita for solo instrument with my idea of what could be a fusion between that and a, a more abstract kind of music that is much more representative of what contemporary classical music is. So that's how the idea of the piece came to be. 
and the I the the I use the melodic turns of phrases and the rhythm from Bomba, and from the that song that I reference at the end of the piece um, that's called Bambula El Seaya, which if it's I mean, maybe it could mean something in Spanish, which I don't know, because usually when when um, Africans, African slaves came to Puerto Rico, there were a lot of words that were mixes between the language that they brought and Spanish. So it, I don't really know what it could mean, but it's based on basically that song and the meaning of, of my wanting to write a, a piece that was a, a mixture of the different influences that I was coming into contact at that moment in my life. Great, thanks, Julio. Um, I wanted to, uh, oh, I'll follow up with my question about writing shorter works. Um, was that on yeah. your mind when you did this or, you know? Yeah, for sure. Uh, the piece was written uh, for a specific deadline. So I, I had a specific time of, of uh, span of days that I need that I had to work for the piece so I I shot at first with all of the ideas that I had in mind um, I like writing short works because as as Sakari said one it's easy to start pulling different ideas and different ideas quickly quickly but I wanted to concentrate more on on smaller ideas and it, for that piece it was a challenge I later ended up doing a longer revision of the same piece, but I, I like the challenge of working with something um, in a particular small frame, even though I ended up revisioning it because sometimes it happens that there are some musical materials that you just can't let go, so. <laughs> um, so I really, I wanted to see, I'm gonna see this, if I can show, um, I don't know if it's allowing me. Oh, probably not. Okay. I wanted to see if I could show them your the the picture that was on the cover. Um, but I can't figure out how to do that. Um, so oh. um, the picture on the cover of the piece. I'm if you wanna, I'll see if I can um make a copy of it and uh post to um the uh, the Facebook page um so people can take a look at it. But uh, do you want to, I'll, I'll take a look and see if I can find it right now, but can you tell me a little bit about that picture and like why you put that on the cover? Yeah, so basically that picture right now, I'm, I'm trying to remember that because usually when I like to use different artworks or designs to represent pieces in the cover on, on, the, on the scores. And basically I, since sometimes it's difficult to, to get in contact and collaborating with graphic artists, I actually for that piece, I looked at a, a old book illustration database that it's in the public domain that I can't remember right now that shows a, uh, basically it's like a bacchanalia where people are dancing around and it, and it kind of gave, gave me the idea of what usually these, um, these circles of, of bomba do, which is basically, it's everyone that's around the community, they, they come in and they start dancing um, there's also there's also a, a, a specific way of doing things because there there's a, a a principal drum drummer that improvises and some dancers improvise with the drummer, but that the I, I chose that particular cover because it showed the essence of what that kind of dance was, which is this this big um, community um, effort of people coming together to and and dance with this with these kinds of music. Yeah, okay, I think we're gonna do it sort of in an old fashioned way. I'll try to show you guys <laughs> this picture. Here you go. I just thought it was really very, in a very evocative drawing. So yes. I was just curious. All right, um, switch back, all right. So thank you very much, Julio. Thank you. Um, all right, next um, is Minato is gonna talk about his piece um, uh, Nocturne for Chinese Railway. Hi, um, so like, hi again. Um, this piece was written uh, two years ago for um, uh, part of the, as, a, as part of a big piece called Chinese Railway, uh, which was for uh, 11 instruments, uh, including a mobile phone sound. So that was a funny piece. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was originally the 
beginning the introduction movement of that piece. And yeah, so this is really based on uh, improvisation. Um, so yeah, again, it, it relates to the idea of uh, working with limitation. So I had um, a deadline and I didn't have a, a good movement um, two days before the deadline and I just improvise on the piano. And sometimes in my composer's life, um, uh, I only sometimes uh, get all the, all the notes just right uh, in one stroke. Yeah, so um, and that, that just, that I wish that could happen more often, but you know, that <laughs> that's not the case, but um, so that's how sort of this fluency of flows of this piece comes. So it's not really worked on and revised, it's just one time through. So, oh yeah, and I played this piece for uh, the, the, for this series, this series, and yeah, there are a lot of findings in my pieces when I, you know, start retaking this piece. So um, I still, I still love this piece a lot. Yeah, um, you performed your own piece and you could really tell um, sort of the joy that you took in it and also um, you really, the spontaneity of the, the feeling of improvisation, I think was, was still really there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, when you narrow the improvisation into a piece, then there's some sort of creativity happens, you know, you mm -hmm. don't really need the absolutely unnecessary note, but, but I didn't really devise a lot for this piece. But yeah, so that, that, that's where interesting creativity works between composition and improvisation. Well, thank you, Minato. Um, all right, I still don't see any, um, any questions. Again, anybody out there on Facebook, if you would like to ask any questions of any composers about anything, oh, okay, anything musical, um, we will, uh, please feel free to um, ask your questions in the comments and we'll come back to it. All right, so uh, we're on to volume four and that's actually the first uh, piece on there that we'll talk about is uh, by me. Um, so I wrote a, a short piece for clarinet um, called Who Did So Tousel Your Dark Hair? And uh, it's sort of inspired by a poem. Um, and I put in a narration of the poem in beforehand. I kind of think of the piece as, as like a, an in the moment reaction of like, what, what did it feel like to be that person in that moment of this poem? Um, and um, the clarinet was just, a, is just a very expressive instrument and can do all kinds of things. And I really love playing um, with the multiphonics. Um, on it. So there's, um, I chose just two multiphonics, one like really, really clear, quiet one. And then one that was supposed to be like really noisy and angry is how I thought of it. Because um, if you read the poem, it's, it sounds, it's sort of, the gist of it is that there's somebody who had been left behind by someone that they cared about, probably a lover. Um, and then that person sort of like shows up out of nowhere when they're just about ready to move on with their life and they're angry. So it's sort of like an immediate visceral reaction. And that's kind of why I picked um, that, that multiphonic is because it was supposed to feel angry and visceral. Um, so yeah, so it's a very, it is actually a very short piece. And um, I really appreciated a lot of the comments that you guys have made about short pieces. Um, part of it, what William said about your circumstances. So like um, many of you know um, that I'm also a mom of two small boys um, and that really limits my time. Um, even, even, when, even when they're being taken care of or you know, being really good, it can still, <laughs> they're around. And in the quarantine, you know, they're still around a lot. So um, that has made it so that I, you know, I've been like, during, since my first son was born, I have been writing a lot more short pieces. Um, I also think that there is something um, to uh, the idea of like leaving them wanting, as Aaron said. Um, sometimes I think it maybe isn't the best idea to completely ring dry like every drop of idea, but to, to leave something wanting or something something more. So I actually have debated on whether or not I want to like add more to this or not. I, I'm still on the fence. We'll, we'll, I might, I might expand it or I might not. Um, but that's my piece. 
So, um, right. Um, next piece is um, also from one of our staff members, Dan Langa, who's been um, sort of the tech person and super thanks to that. But Dan, we're gonna talk about your piece. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I wrote this piece, uh, it was originally, um, it was originally uh, commissioned by a friend of mine from my undergrad uh, at Amherst College, and she was doing her um, she was doing her senior thesis recital. And I forgetting the exact wording of the prompt, but I think the main theme around her um, recital was sort of bending time. That was the main theme. Um, and so I went and I kind of came up with this line that uh, was passed between two hands and had a lot of polyrhythms and there's a lot of disconnection between the two hands and uh, after that coming up with that it sort of became a little bit stuck uh, as to where I should go with it and then um, stumbled across the word deliquest which is the uh, title of the piece and um, it, so I felt like it started to fit the definition and there are sort of three definitions that I felt like I, then I latched on to as um, potential uh, sort of inspiration for different parts of the piece so um, to become liquid and absorb moisture from the air sort of felt like the um, sort of the growing texture uh, in the chords to melt away sort of felt like some of the lines and to form many small divisions um, seemed sort of like the the rhythm. Um, so that uh, that's sort of how the piece came about. In terms of small pieces, um, I really never before this year thought too much about writing small pieces. Um, and then uh, once everything got shut down, it was hard to sort of keep my attention on things. So it was a great way just to not get frustra frustrated with having ideas and not being able to um, sort of get to get started on them immediately. Um, and so it's sort of not until this year that I've really started writing a lot of small pieces and that, that's really been great. Cool. Um, we had an immediate question. Uh, uh, if you could just rev uh, review what those three definitions of deliquests were. Sure. Um, so the first one is to become liquid by absorbing moisture from the air as certain salts. Two is to melt away. And three is um, in the realm of botany to form many small divisions or branches. Yeah. So yeah, with that uh, with that word and with the, I had a lot of fun finding um, images for this one. Yeah, Just yeah, I like the melting. I like the, <laughs> I, I do like the ones you picked. I like those a lot. So. All right. Um, and what was, um, and I was, uh, noticing when you, you mentioned the word, but you said you just, how did you find the word? You might've said this and I apologize if you're repeating yourself. No, I don't, I don't think I said how, I honestly don't really remember. It was definitely just reading something. I think it was, um, I, th I think it was in just like a book I was reading at the time and I really wish I knew the title but I don't really know yeah it was just something um it was kind of I do know that I finished the piece the the premiere was supposed to happen in March I don't think it ended up happening in the way it was it did get played I think just for the department but there there were, weren't a, wasn't allowed to be an audience at that time but it so I finished the piece kind of right when everything was starting to ramp up with COVID so I think I uh, it was just something I was reading to take my mind off everything, but I really can't remember. I wish I could, but yeah, it was just in a book. Yeah, it's just, it is, it's just a cool word. It just yeah. looks cool. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. <laughs> definitely. Great. All right. Thanks so much, Dan. Thank you. Um, I did have one question on um, Amazon about extended clarinet techniques. Um, and I uh, put a book. Uh, response in the chat. Um, it's called New Directions for Clarinet. Um, I had I went to under uh, my I went did my master's with um, a close friend um, Joshua Gardner. Who, if you are a clarinetist, you probably have heard of him. He's really well known. Um, 
and he recommends this book and he's actually like helped develop some different and new clarinet techniques. And I've worked with him a lot, which is how I got into um, writing, like using those and, and doing it maybe a little bit more often and experimenting with it. So, all right. Next, um, ah, next up is uh, Kirsten Johnson again um, on her piece Being. Yeah, um, there is a story behind this actually. What Beth was saying about being a parent resonates because I'm also a parent and this piece was actually written for my daughter's fourth birthday. Um, I just sat down at the piano and I wanted to write her something and she was too young to know what I was doing anyway, but it was the inspiration behind it. So I took her name and I sort of, it's kind of kitsch, but I just associated musical pitches with the letters of her name to come up with the, the melodic material. And then once I had that, I just let it develop. Um, but yeah, it's, it was started out as a piano piece, but once I came up with the melodic material, I decided that actually it was enough just with what it was. Um, so I then thought about what instrument I wanted it to be for. I played a lot of clarinet in high school and college, so I know the clarinet pretty well. And I wanted uh, an instrument that had sort of depth and resonance and body to it, um, because for me, the reason I called it being, it's it's the essence of, of who we are, that before we have a child and that child's not in our life, you know everything changes because this being is there. Um, and so it's just sort of the essence of humanity. And that that's sort of what the piece is about to me. And, and when I hear the piece, I, I think of my daughter. It's It doesn't really resemble her personality or anything like that, but that's what was inspiring behind it. Yeah, sort of more yeah. like a, a reaction of your feelings for her or like an expression yeah. of your feelings for her, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah. Great. <laughs> so it's not a compl it's not a complicated piece. Um, I've put the score up on my website if people want to see the score because um, it's out there and I'm happy for people to, to play around with it. I really like what Stephanie did to it. Um, she played it differently than I would play it and I liked it. I really liked what she brought to it. It was really the way she soared with the, the major minor sevenths and she just it was really, really, really wonderful hearing somebody else's interpretation of it. So thank you, Stephanie, for that. Right. Thank you, Kirsten. All right, yeah. we have just uh, one piece left. Um, um, uh, Madeline Chang, uh, the piece, uh, Words Are Last to Fall Asleep. So Madeline, you want to tell us about your work? I'd love to. Thank you so much. Um, well, first of all, I adored the performance yesterday. Um, I love interpretation. I see my performers in this Zoom call right now. So hi, and thank you so much. Um, this piece was actually written um, this summer for a program called the Young Women's um, Composer Camp. It's for um, like high school and college aged um, women and non-binary composers. And um, um, it, we had, this, this program took place in about two weeks, I think. And then we had to have our um, piece ready by the end of that time. But um, really I was um, just focused on um, getting inspiration from the classes and I didn't really like focus on my on like getting my piece done until probably like the very last day um, when I was um, embarking on a road trip to um, Crater Lake. So I pretty much wrote this thing like on the car ride there um, on the eight hour drive over to Crater Lake. But um, it was um, a great, it was, it was absolutely great because it's the end of a very, very inspirational um, two week program. And I was starting to get out into nature and getting inspired. So it was, it was, um, it, it was a really productive eight hour session. Um, and I had a lot of fun with this piece. Um, this is probably answering your next question, but it had to be, it had to be short. They said it had to be like, I think, with a three minute cap on it. And it did end up being three minutes on my program. Um, but I think the performance um, is usually tends to be a little bit, um, a little bit longer. So it ended up being around more four minutes, but that's okay. Cause it fit with the quarantine snacks time limit. So I was really grateful to have it performed here. Um, it was, in, it was um, largely inspired by um, Kate Soper's Only the Words Themselves Mean What They Say, the duet for um, soprano and um, bass slash sea flute. And it's abs absolutely incredible piece. Um, it's riveting. Like it feels a lot shorter than it is because you just you just can't can't look away from the performance. Um, 
And so I really, really loved that. I basically was, I basically listened to that on repeat for quite a long time. And um, it was also inspired by, um, by the conversations that um, one of my closest friends and I have, because we have very, very late night conversations. Um, they can go on for hours and hours. Um, and even after, even after they end and we're about to fall asleep because it's so late in the night, um, you still have like the words lingering on, you still have like the memories floating around from the conversations and you're so tired and exhausted, but they're sort of like the last things. And the title itself is inspired by something that um, he said, because I was asking him because he sounded, it was so late at night, but he sounded really, really coherent still. And his words were still very, very, um, there's, they're still very, I don't know, I don't know what the word is. Um, they're uh, very eloquent. And I was like, how are you still speaking so well? And it's like 3, 4 a.m. And he, he said something like, it's like, oh yeah, my words are the last things to fall asleep. And I'm like, that's a good piece title. So I took that and basically put it as my piece title. That's, that's the story behind my piece. Great. That's like, oh, it's just great. Yeah, we had wanted to do, we had actually been planning to do that Kate Soper piece um, with Stephanie Lampria and Deirdre who performed your piece, um, but that got canceled slash moved on. We're not sure yet <laughs> because of the quarantine, you know, because of the, the virus. But um, I'm trying to think if there is, um, I, I was actually curious, um, uh, Madeline, about um, switching flutes. I can't remember if uh, the they switch flutes in that soper piece, but um, just like um, kind of like why did you do that and did you did you factor that in um, and is it like I don't know did you think about like the physicality of the fact you know of the switching when you when you decided to do that just yes absolutely um, I definitely wanted to make sure it was enough time <laughs> to switch between so I think I've I don't remember exactly what I um, put but I think musically like there's sort of a natural break there so you can you can you can take your time um, switching flutes there. Um, I originally was just going to do it for C flute because that's what I was more familiar with. Um, I was really scared to write for basically any other flute even though I knew my um, performer for um, the summer program I did um, was it was very um, good at all types of flutes. Um, I was just, I was a bit scared to branch out. But then um, when I heard um, Kate Soper's work where um, I think she switches between um, C flute then to bass flute. And then I think she ends up with piccolo at the end. Um, I, I really liked how like some techniques especially on the bass flute sounded like really, really pronounced. And I've, I just, I just had to <laughs> include it in there. Um, I did end up um, using C flute at the end just so I could um, have some of the higher um, fluttery notes that I enjoyed, but I did really want the um, like the sort of tremolo harmonics. I thought they sounded really, really awesome on the bass flute. Great. So um, I did have one question. I gotta um, what the Kate the title of the Kate Soper piece um, is. If anybody knows it, yeah, I believe it's like only the words themselves mean what they say. It's a yes, long, that's a fascinating it. title. Yeah. Yeah. Only the words themselves mean what they say. And she has it on YouTube if anybody wants to see it. I'll, I'll throw the link up um, onto the Facebook uh, chat. So if anybody wants to check it out, it is a really cool piece. And she's a very, um, very talented composer. Um, and she's a, a singer composer. She like, I think, yeah, she, she does things with her voice that are amazing. <laughs> so great um so that was our last um thing i will show in uh, as i said i'll, I'll add up a, a link to the youtube of that piece if anybody wants to see it i want to thank everybody um that watched thank you so much and i also want to give an extra special thanks to all of our composers and our performers you guys i had a great time chatting with all of you and it's almost done sweetie okay. <laughs> and uh I guess we hit the hour mark where I got to go see my kids. <laughs> so thank you to everyone. Thank you, Beth. So we, we just ended the live.